and maybe a more personal question. Uh, I'm curious, you, you know, both of the stories you kind of shared were around, you know, you framed a kind of arrogant, and we use that language here uh, internally as well. Were there any kind of rituals or kind of practices at a personal level that you thought about, um, that you practiced kind of in the moment as you led, I mean, huge organizations, even personally, to, to kind of, um, you know, not have to wait necessarily, you know, multiple years later to recognize you could have had maybe a different approach. Um, were there rituals you did to kind of stop yourself in moment to, to think about, um, you know, kind of offsetting a little bit of maybe your initial, quote unquote, more arrogant reactions? Yes. <laughs> All right. I will, ex I will explain. Um, I've already told you a little bit about my background being raised in Fort Worth. I'm Jewish. There were 14 or 15 Jews in my school of 1,500 people. There, everybody else was a Baptist, or not everybody, but 98% of the people were Baptist. And so I lived in a world where I couldn't be in a family. We didn't have enough money to, but if we had enough money, we couldn't join the country club. I couldn't join certain social clubs inside the high school. I was the other. Now, I, I had white skin. If I had black skin or brown skin, I also, or if I was a female, I would have been the other in this time period. I think the, the power that my parents and my grandparents uh, gave me was they had two messages that were obligatory in our family. One was if you have anything in excess, you are required to share it with other people. That's a form of what Christians call charity and what Jews call sadaka, or commitment to helping other people. The second thing I learned by osmosis was one set of grandparents barely spoke English, they spoke Yiddish at home, they had kosher cooking, they were ultra-religious. Another set of grandparents were German-based, spoke German at home, uh, were very sophisticated. And then I had the community that I lived in. So I moved between a very religious Russian Jewish culture into a German uh, opera-loving, sophisticated classical music culture, and then the world that I lived in in my school. I learned how to go between cultures. And while I wasn't a chameleon, I, because of this idea of giving to the other, I understood at a very early age, I had to place myself in the other's shoes to understand what was going on. And I think the practice that that I developed over time was when I went to foreign countries as a representative of EDS, like we opened up Japan. I studied Japanese history. I studied Japanese food. I studied Japanese culture. When I went, I ate Japanese food with chopsticks. I understood what they were talking about, et cetera. How, number one, I was intellectually interested in it, but more importantly, I was doing what I did as a kid. I was transforming myself like Zelig to go to become Japanese or Chinese or French, for God's sake, or <laughs> English. I mean, the French were really difficult to deal with or whatever. And I think that by learning how to place myself into the psyche of the other person, then I could listen to myself and from time to time say, you're a loud mouth know-it-all. Why don't you shut up? And I, so I, that, that would be my answer to that. Um, Chris in London, if he's on the upper right hand corner. Hi, Lord, thank you so much for that um, talk. Um, it was really interesting. My first question that I have here is, is around really what, what course Okay, um, I left General Motors December 7th, 1986, a date 
which I selected, and thank you for laughing. Nobody in General Motors got it. <laughs> I selected the date, the announcement of Morton Meyerson, CTO resigns, December 7th, and nobody laughed, and I, it was, I was really angry about that. For five, five years, I did investments with Richard Rainwater, who's a pretty famous investor in Fort Worth who worked with the Bass Brothers. I played football with his brother, and his mother went to high school with my father, and I kind of officed with him and made a lot of money and discovered investing professionally in Wall Street was not something I was attracted to. Even though it was very lucrative, it was no fun for me. And Michael Dell asked me if I would help him when he was like 20 years old and his company was small and I worked with Michael for about three years um, and eventually I became CEO of Pro Systems. Then I resigned in 1998. In 1998, I had had it with uh, corporate stuff, big companies. Currently, I'm a grandfather, my mother is still alive, I'm a father of two daughters that survived. My son died in 1998. Um, I run a foundation and I make investments. And the investments are to fund what is going out in the foundation. And I mentioned this earlier today. I'm trying to create a perpetual motion machine. Our objective is to make 20% IRR, internal rate of return, on the investments. Every time we monetize an investment, we get sell the company or something. I take 20%, plus or minus, generally 20%, of the proceeds, move it into the foundation, pay tax on the 80%, and then reinvest the 80%. If you get a 20% return, you have an ever-growing base. And when I die, 100% of what I own goes into the foundation. So I'm not building wealth for, so I can have grandkids that fly in private airplanes. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, I don't believe in that. I think America was built on the back of immigrants and it's built on the back of people who want to do things and get things done and I want to support that. And in the, the foundation, our focus, think of us as a VC, a venture capitalist, of uh, nonprofits. We go with small people, really smart, don't have money, doing unusual things, and providing something to people that can't do it themselves. Food, healthcare, education, access to, to governmental programs, immunization, whatever. If they can't do it themselves, we find people that help them, and we work a lot in Israel where there's a refugee problem, people that walked across Africa, they get in Israel. Israel's got 60,000 refugees, they don't know what to do with them. They can't throw them out because Jews don't do that. They can't keep them because they don't have enough money. And so we set up programs for their education and health and food, et cetera. So that's what we do. Uh, Jonathan, you guys have a question for Cisco? I'm down in the bottom left. San Francisco is sparse out there. Um, I guess with all the speakers coming in, uh, one thing that uh, I have been curious about is uh, what's one of the best advice that you've heard and that you like to transfer to us? What's the best advice? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to answer the question, but I don't really have the best advice. Um, that's very, when I, when I teach at University of Texas or other places, when I teach classes, I'm often asked uh, what are the seven things that you do or the ten things you do or the three things you do, et cetera. And I'm not much of a list maker, um, but I will, I will pass on what I consider to be a fundamental truth that is good for life and is good for business and it's good for nonprofits too and that is the most precious thing besides your living and continuing to live and 
living in a healthy way is to maintain, foster, and work on relationships. And that is, I mean, personal relationships, I mean, corporate relationships, I mean, relationships with nonprofits, relationships with government, or whatever you choose. When I look back on my life, the most successful things that have happened to me have come from relationships. On Sunday night, my daughter, who's 44, um, was uh, honored in a very large uh, evening benefit fundraiser for the Jewish Community Center of Manhattan, which is the West Side Jewish Community Center. And about 250 people were there. They raised a lot of money. And I've gone to 100 things like that. I hate them all. I'm basically an introvert. I don't like crowds. I don't like chit-chatting with people. Uh, that was, but they did something different. They honored the family rather than Marty, my daughter, which I thought was smart. And each of the grand, my grandchildren, her three children, and her husband, and the professional in the organization gave three-minute speeches. So it was like fast. And I watched my grandchildren talk. I have a six-year-old grandchild. They did a two-hour interview with him and chopped it and made it into a video because he's, he couldn't possibly give a public speech. But my 12-year-old grandson gave a talk that I couldn't have given until I was 30. My 14-year-old granddaughter gave a talk that I couldn't ever do. It was that good. And at that moment, I realized that the relationship and the passing on is not the genes. It's the uh, way of being, that the passing it on, at that particular moment, everything was working. Every great business deal, I did one business deal back in, I can't even remember, 88 or so. Mark Cuban came in my office and asked if I would give him some money with his partner, Todd Wagner, and I said, for what? And he said, we're gonna broadcast basketball games and put them on the internet. I said, it's the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. <laughs> And so we talked for 15 minutes, and I, I had an advantage. I knew uh, assistant engineers that had worked for Mark in his prior company, and I knew that he's really smart. He's not very pleasant, but he's really, really smart. And so I, I uh, made the investment. Uh, after I asked him, how much money do you want? He said, I don't know. I said, what price? He said, I don't know. So I basically invented the deal. and. Uh, I made 2,000 to one return, not 2,000%. I got $2,000 back for every dollar I invested. That was the greatest. However, 80% of the things I invest in go bankrupt. <laughs> so that's, that's the other side of it. That meeting with Mark Cuban didn't come because I was searching. It came because I have a friend that I worked with in the city who called me and said, I know somebody that's looking for money. He's your kind of person you ought to invest. That happened over and over and over again in my life. Relationships is everything. Okay, so from the New York office, I'll take this one question to start. Um, it says, you mentioned that much of your pers uh, perspective came from like time and just age. And it says, how can, you, how can we actively develop that sense of perspective? You guys hear the question? All right, so I, what I have developed had to do with time and absorption and what can, the question is what can, what could they do? Gain perspective now, if you say they don't have the experience, how do you gain perspective? Just be open, I mean, I mean the, the answer to that's pretty simple. Just be open to things that happen to you and people that come into your life and opportunities that come into your life. Being open is, I think Woody Allen said showing up is what, 50% or 80% of the game? Mm -hmm. Showing up is part of it. The other part of it is not saying no. 
being open. Now, you can say yes to things that you shouldn't, like use of drugs, violence, abuse of alcohol, etc. I'm not suggesting you say yes to everything. All I'm saying is when opportunities present themselves, most people that I know and observe have a practiced habit of parsing through it and saying what's good for me and saying no. And I would suggest that not parsing through it would be advantageous and try to say yes to some things that where you're uncomfortable. I've already told you I'm an introvert. Uh, I don't know if, do you guys ever do Myers-Briggs here? No. All right, Myers-Briggs is a test. It gives you tendency. It's not a personality test. It gives you tendencies or what you like. There is a scale of extrovert and introvert, and it goes from plus 26 extrovert to plus 26 introvert. I'm a 25. I mean, it's almost a perfect introvert. I hate parties. I hate strangers. I, I don't chit-chat and so on and so forth. And so I have had to get out of my body and force myself to say hello to people. And it's amazing what happens if you say hello and you're open to the possibility that the person on the other side of the, your face is somebody that will be good for you or something good will come out of it. Um, I say one other word and then we can go on. Do we ever get to live questions or we just? These are live. Oh, yeah. No, 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 I'm talking about where people just say spontaneously. All right, what do you? We can let the math happen. All right. We'll, we'll go around to the other options and then you can. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm very interested in language. Now, I'm I, not foreign language. I'm very poor at languages. I'm just interested in words. And uh, everybody's heard of the two faces of Janus, or perhaps you've heard of it. Like, and theater has smiling and frowning. The word for face in Hebrew is panim, P-A-N-I-M. I am is plural. Of course, that raises the question, why would Hebrew have a word that is plural that is singular and plural? It's both. And the answer is because the founders of the language understood that there is no such thing as a face. There is an internal face, and there is an external face. In Japanese, it's, there's two words, the face that you present to the outer world and the inner face, hone and tatame. Many cultures have this. It's really important that you don't get confused about who you're presenting yourself as and who you are, or who the other person is as they present themselves versus who they really are. And if you'll give a little bit of courtesy and warmth to the other person, the possibility that they've actually got something going on behind that mask or their hostility. Dealing with people that are abusive and hostile in language, particularly at work, particularly in software engineering, you know, where the people I worked with, 50% of them were on the spectrum somewhere. We had, it was just amazing how difficult it was to talk to them. If you can ever penetrate that and get behind it, frequently you'll discover there is a person who is scared or vulnerable or is not confident. And sometimes you can be the way to help them out of that. That's a great thing. Thank you. Bob, thanks. Greg, do you guys have a question? Maybe you want to let the person who asked it ask it, because <laughs> I, think, I think more it's interested in hearing it from no, I don't, I don't care. You want. I can I can do it either way. Since I have no idea who wrote this question, okay. <laughs> I'll, um, so, so in reference um, more to your article that, that Charlie spoke on in '96 about what leaders get wrong, 
kind of almost, you know, 15, 18 years later, uh, what, what do we still get wrong, or what are popular notions about leadership that are still wrong um, that you know, you'd like to kind of call out today? Well, in addition to the things I've already said, I would suggest without any arrogance or ego, you might want to pull the Fast Company article and read it. Uh, I, if I had, were to rewrite that article 18 years later, I wouldn't change much. I, I, I think the in, the, I, that article started with a burst of insight that I had one day after I left General Motors um, where I asked myself the question, I've been successful, I've made money, I came from a poor family, I've gotten success, notoriety, so on and so forth. I asked the question, is this all there is to it? And the answer that came back to me was, there's much more to it, but it's got little to do with the success or the attributes or the baubles or the bangles or the money or anything else. So I, I think what I had to say about leadership is primarily contained in, in that article. I must tell you it was a controversial article when I wrote it in 1996 because that kind of thinking was, we were still in the monolithic white male dominated military organizations and they thought that I was, I mean I actually had a person, I gave a talk at, at uh, MIT Sloan School and I talked about this article, and I had somebody come up out of the audience after it with a red face, yelling at me, saying, you are going to destroy America. And I, I said, why? And he said, you have communist ideas. You are not talking about the way things get done. The way things get done is leaders tell followers what to do. And I said, that's bullshit. And that was not a good thing. <laughs> so I don't have much more to say than I said at that time. You ought to read it. If you wanted to email me, you can get my email address. It's mort at 2m.com. If you got a question, I'd be happy to answer it. But I, I think what I said then is what I'd say now. All right, um, what's the one thing I'd like to be remembered for? Uh, I'd like to be remembered for a person that was willing to change. Grandpa Silas, is that it? That's it. <laughs> um, San Francisco, Jonathan? Yes. Well, Perot is a very strong personality, and his motto and the company motto was, eagles don't flock, you have to find them one at a time. That, that's the entire phrase. There's a, there's a big difference between the Perot that you see as presidential candidate, CEO, uh, 
founder of EDS, board member of GM, chastising GM, etc. I'm not going to make up that Ross is a perfect person. Ross is like me, like you. There are no perfect people. Ross had a characteristic that was very unusual for a very strong personality, and that was that Ross, he, he never stated this, but I observed this. Ross was with you win or win. Let's absorb that for a second. Ross was with you win or win, W-I-N or win, meaning as long as you were successful and you didn't violate the law or the company values, he didn't care how you did it. That's how I got to be a success. It's impossible that I would become the CEO of EDS I was an army officer, not a navy officer. I was Jewish, not Presbyterian. I was from Fort Worth, not from East Texas. I mean, there's a, there were all kinds of people in the company before me that I joined. Had been there longer than me, had more experience, had worked for IBM, had every right attribute, and yet I became the CEO. And it wasn't because I'm Mr. Magnificent, it was that when handed the ball and asked to deliver, we got a touchdown. We made a lot of money and we built a company that was very powerful on a new idea called outsourcing and then later BPO, business process outsourcing, that was the first time it was ever done. Ross looked at that and said, this is the guy to run it and he can do it differently. When this article came out, Ross called me in his office and he said, I see that you've written an article for Fast Company. And I said, yes. And he said, I hate the article. And I said, why do you hate the article? And he said, because you're criticizing everything that I stand for and EDS stand for. And I said, Ross, I'm not criticizing you and I'm not criticizing the company. I'm criticizing myself. And he said, promise me you won't do it again. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, oh, and that was the end of the conversation. Now that, that was Perot. I mean, that was my relationship with him. I didn't confront him or argue with him. I avoided him and I dodged. And I, I was called the umbrella for many years. I held an umbrella above my head and above all the people in the company so that he wouldn't rain down in acid rain and kill them all. <laughs> now, he's not a bad guy. He's a he started the company. He, I mean, he is the legend in his own time. We do things differently. That characteristic of being able to accept the other and not have it adhere to every thing and way that you do is a very powerful idea. That, that's how you deal with it, I think. Was there maybe one last question? I don't know if Boston or London in particular and here in New York. Take one last We have one in London from Turin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. This is the second question that I had. Do I have any routines? I have to think. That sounds like it must be part of this corporate culture. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Yes. I have to think about that. Um, if, if, if any of you, do you know who Tibby the Cat is? All right, there, there's, a, there's a fabulous drawing of a cat and the cat is sitting in the center and there's circles around the cat and it has to do with the cat moving into places that's uncomfortable for the cat and the outer circle is certain death. That's how the cat looks at it. That's how introverts look at the world. There are zones that are comfortable to talk with other people 
but most of it is certain death. And the routine that I use is I say to myself, so what's the worst that can happen? Will the person bite me, strike me? Will the person disappoint me or whatever? And I just try to move past that. I am not always successful. I am a total failure at cocktail parties. Well, number one, I don't drink, so that's a bad thing. And because everybody says, oh, you must have been an alcoholic, or, which I wasn't. <laughs> um, putting, putting yourself into the zone of vulnerability is very difficult for most people, but for introverts, is certain death. And I try to force myself into that zone, which I'm now going to steal another person's idea that I've always liked. And it's, there's a man who used to run Visa that I knew who invented a word called chaotic. Anybody ever heard that word before? Okay. Chaotic space is the space in between chaos and order. There is a zone of chaotic. I, I wish I'd invented it. And he, he claimed that that's where all creativity takes place. And I, I think that he had a great idea. I actually believe that, to add on to that idea, that the interface is where all creativity takes place. The interface, the interface between order and chaos. In the Bible, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, what was there in the beginning? Hello? Are there any Bible readers here? <laughs> what? I said in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was God. In the beginning there was nothing. It was chaos. And from this, in seven days, God created the world. So this story, I mean, there's Sumerian stories, like there's all kinds of stories, Buddhist stories, Hindu stories, etc. And if you think about the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset versus what it's like at high noon, I think you get the idea. I believe it's because the sun and the sky and the earth are at the interface of the dawn or the interface of the sunset, and that's what creates the beauty. And I think this is where ideas happen. And in regards to introversion or being uncomfortable or doing things to get yourself at this zone between z chaos and order is the place to be and put one leg in both and see if you can handle it and thank you very much